Hi, everyone. Welcome this evening to our event, Preparing for the Conference of the Parties, uh, hosted by Climate Generation and the University of Minnesota as part of the Swing Climate Policy Series. Uh, we'll begin here in just a few minutes uh, as we wait for folks to log on. Thanks a lot. Good evening, everyone. We'll get started in just a minute or so here. Thanks a lot for joining us. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started now. Uh, welcome to the event Preparing for the Conference of the Parties, hosted this evening with Climate Generation and the University of Minnesota as part of the Swain Climate Policy Series, Advancing Climate Solutions Now. I'm Gabe Chan, Associate Professor at the Humphrey School, and really happy to be uh, welcoming you all to this uh, online space this evening with a really fantastic lineup uh, of speakers. Um, uh, that will be um, addressing their climate stories as the key focal point for uh, this evening's programming. But before we get started, uh, I wanted to share a bit about our Climate Week uh, schedule of events. Uh, here we are on Thursday um, at our uh, eighth uh, of 10 events this week uh, that we've been hosting as part of the University of Minnesota Climate Week. We've been doing uh, panel talks. Uh, we had uh, Vice President Al Gore on Tuesday night. Last night, we had a really invigorating visioning session with student leaders from all across the university. And each morning, we've been having coffee chats with leaders from the university who've talked about different intersections of climate change uh, and action uh, that's been happening. Uh, coming up after tonight, tomorrow morning, we'll be having our last coffee chat on ecosystem health with leaders from the university who are looking at intersections of climate and health. And then tomorrow afternoon at 3.30, we have an event for students on climate and sustainability board games. This will be a really fun event um, for, uh, for our last uh, event this week. 
Um, as a bit of recap, in case you missed it, uh, we've launched two new events this week um, as part of Climate Week uh, that I want to draw everyone's attention to, particularly the students who are tuning in tonight. Uh, the first is an opportunity for undergraduate students called the Swain Energy Leaders Program. Uh, this is a new program we're really pleased to be announcing this week for undergraduates um, in any department, any college, um, and it provides uh, stipends. Uh, it has a, a new special course related to climate activism. There'll be linked to this uh, program, as well as internships uh, related to energy transition. If you're an undergraduate and interested in really leveling up your capabilities around climate action, I encourage you to visit the link at that QR code. And then the other big announcement this week is the launch of a request for proposals for students on climate action. It's a really open-ended proposal for students at any of the five University of Minnesota campuses to develop programming or events that connect the University of Minnesota community broadly with climate action. That can be through anything from events like the one we're having tonight to um, uh, trainings on climate communication, to dialogues with political leaders, to new partnerships and projects with nonprofit organizations like Climate Generation, the one we're hearing from tonight, uh, or really up to uh, your imagination. Uh, if you're interested in learning more as well as learning from a spreadsheet of 50 to 70 ideas that we've harvested from universities all across the country, follow the uh, lighter green QR code on the right here. So uh, for tonight's programming, we will be talking about the Conference of the Parties, in particular, the uh, COP26, which is the 26th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. I have just a few slides here to introduce COP26 and what uh, our uh, delegate members that we'll be hearing from tonight uh, will be sharing with us. So just as a bit of background, COP26, it's the 26th time uh, that uh, the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention have come together at the annual summit. The first one was actually, well, the first meeting of the UNFCCC was in 1992 when uh, the uh, Framework Convention was established at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And since then, nearly all countries of the world continue to meet basically annually to negotiate the framework and implementation of international climate policy. So COP26 is the 26th such meeting. What happens at a COP? A lot of things happen at a COP. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the main purpose of the COP has historically been for diplomats and leaders from all over the world to engage in formal negotiations. Here on the right, you can see many of those world leaders uh, who engaged uh, at the Conference of the Parties in 2015 in Paris. But also increasingly, uh, COPs, Conference of the Parties, also engage civil society leaders in informational dialogues. Uh, there are a lot of events called side events uh, in which there's opportunities to learn from and share uh, new information, new research, new frameworks for thinking about climate action. But also increasingly, COPs have become places for members of the public to demonstrate and have their voices heard. And for a lot of our delegate members, I think one really important aspect as well is also the opportunity to convene and learn from people, thousands of people from all over the world who all are prioritizing climate action in their lives. So what's going to happen at COP26? COP26 begins next week. Um, it is the fifth conference of the party since the landmark 2015 Paris Agreement, COP21. The Paris Agreement established a new framework for international climate policy centered around this concept of nationally determined contributions. Nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, are essentially climate pledges that countries, national countries, or parties to the uh, Paris Agreement make. That's what they say they're going to do on climate change. The Paris Agreement also included a new goal of limiting global temperatures to well below 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 Fahrenheit, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So Paris had a lot of details in it. At its core was this notion of, of party pledges or nationally determined contributions and this overall goal of limiting temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius. So one of the really big questions hanging over COP26, again, the fifth COP since the Paris Agreement is, will this COP represent a progression? Meaning, is it going to 
are the pledges that come about during uh, ahead of and during this COP going to represent action commensurate with the goals that were set in 2015? One of the key aspects of the Paris Agreement is that it sets about a framework that climate action is something that requires countries to build off of the ambition off of each other. It establishes something called the ratchet mechanism by which countries make pledges and then other countries measure, assess those pledges and then use that as inspiration and motivation to do more. And so part of the COP thinking or part of the thinking in the Paris Agreement that will be tested at this COP is whether the new round of nationally determined contributions really do represent that progression. And a key priority will be finding ways to raise the level of ambition and build stronger commitments, and particularly not just words, but also implementation and promises of action and actual meaningful actions that live up to uh, those pledges. You'll see on the right here a figure from, uh, from a group called the Climate Action Tracker, which looks at all of the pledges that have been made to date uh, under the Paris Agreement framework and shows that so far under current policies, global average temperatures would rise to 2.9 degrees Celsius. The pledges that are in the books are bring it down to 2.5 2.4 degrees Celsius, excuse me. And so it seems like our pledges are starting to move in this direction. If you look at, if you compare this figure to the initial round of pledges, there has been this progression in the pledges. But some of the critiques is, well, where's the action? How does the action live up to those pledges? And that'll be one of the key questions at COP26 is, are we seeing progress to the actions that live up to the goals of the Paris Agreement? So for tonight, uh, we're really excited to bring uh, six members, uh, six uh, members who are associated with Minnesota organizations who will be attending COP next week. Uh, here in Minnesota, we have an unprecedented level of participation in the COP, I believe. Yes, at least 66 Minnesotans will be in Glasgow next week and the following, including state representatives, frontline activists, members of the faith community, academia, NGOs, youth organizations, and indigenous representatives, among many others. And tonight we're going to hear from six individuals uh, from Minnesota who are attending COP26 to hear their climate stories. But before we hear from them, I'm going to pass it over to Kristen Poppleton from uh, climate Generation will tell a little bit about uh, what Climate Generation is and uh, what a climate story is. Thanks, Gabe. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm Kristen Poppleton, and I am the Senior Director of Programs of Climate Generation, a Will Steer Legacy. And we are a nonprofit uh, based actually here in Minneapolis that empowers individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change. Um, and we do that by igniting and sustaining uh, the ability of educators and youth and communities to act on the systems that are perpetuating the climate crisis. So um, in our work as a national leader in climate change ed, convener of high school climate activists and mentor of climate stories for action, we've been bringing delegations to the COP since 2009. And we are gonna be on the ground in Glasgow um, leaving actually taking off tomorrow, the first of us with six amazing leaders that are from across the United States. I'm really proud and grateful to three of them that agreed to join us here tonight, two of them who are also taking off um, tomorrow night also for Glasgow. Um, and our delegation represents um, really diverse communities from across the US, diverse um, uh, peoples and uh, diversity of solutions and impacts of climate change. And while they're in COP, they're at the COP, our delegates are going to be collecting climate stories. They're going to be sharing daily summaries of negotiations, doing interviews, hosting live streams, um, and crafting blogs for a daily email digest that you can subscribe to if you want to. Um, and our goal really um, organizationally is not to tell the really high level policy wonky story, but to make this international climate policy something that's accessible for everyone. So for all of you that are joining here tonight, uh, we're excited just for some opportunities to maybe connect our delegates to you. Um, if you're a climate leader going or if you're the media and you want to learn and share about them, um, feel free to connect with us as well. Uh, so why are we um, telling stories and, and why are we going to the COP? What's our focus of the COP? 
we um, in our organization focus on something that's actually at the heart of uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And that is action for in climate empowerment, which is called ACE. And that work is actually included um, in the Paris Agreement, as well as the uh, founding convention on climate change. And action for climate empowerment work is where all the, um, the work that's um, around engaging society in climate action through education, through training, through public awareness, through public participation and access to information and cooperation happens. So essentially, we think of it as people-centered action. It's what needs to happen to make solutions understandable and accessible. And um, it's work that we know is critical for igniting that fire to actually take action. Um, and so this year, we're actually really proud also, our, this delegation is a member of a greater US ACE coalition, which is uh, organizations and institutions and experts that are working on this just efficient all of society action uh, towards climate change. And so um, at Climate Generation, we ground our work in these principles. We work with over 8,000 educators across North America. We mentor youth um, and uh, provide leadership opportunities to them uh, to engage in public policy and local action projects. And then we uh, focus on this centering of stories through all of our work, this connecting the head and the heart on the issue uh, to help make it personal and local to everyone, um, because we're all eyewitnesses to climate change, um, which is a good segue just into um, our founder, Will Steger, a polar explorer educator. For those of you in Minnesota, you're probably familiar with him. He is one of the first eyewitness to climate change storytellers, um, and his story is really what founded our organization and was what we um, leveraged for many years um, with others. And, and now we know that everyone has actually a climate change story. Um, when we were founded, that wasn't necessarily as commonplace. Um, and it's important for us to help people tell that story um, and use it um, for action, to move people to solutions, to move people to action. And so over the last uh, several years, we've worked with hundreds of um, individuals to help them cultivate, to share their personal story. And uh, we decided tonight that story was how we wanted to introduce you to our delegates, um, because we know that uh, personal story is what moves people and what really connects people to an issue. And even if you're listening to a story from Miami, Florida, for example, which you may hear here shortly, um, and you've never been there, if the story is about making jam, maybe you've made jam before and you and listening to the story find this way to connect with this person and connect with them in a way that makes you want to know more and learn more about an issue. Um, we are so excited for you all to hear and share the stories that we have here this evening. Um, but we also wanna really acknowledge that sharing personal story is really brave and courageous and vulnerable. And so I just want hope that our storytellers this e evening will accept um, our words of, uh, of gracias and of miigwech and thank you uh, for sharing this evening because um, we know that it's hard to tell your personal story. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce our first storyteller, um, Julieta Rodrigo, um, one of Climate Generation's Window into COP26 delegates. Julieta is coming to us from Miami, Florida. Um, she's a certified climate science educator and community uh, communicator uh, who grew up in a family of, of immigrants. And her background is rooted in the belief that effective communication is a great way to bring diverse people together. Um, in her role as program manager at the Clio Institute, she educates students, teachers, and the general public about the climate crisis. She was born in Argentina and lives now in Miami, a city colloquial known as ground zero for climate impacts. And I'm gonna turn it over to Julieta. Thanks, Kristen. And thank you, everybody. Good evening. I'm so glad that you're here. I'll, I'll be sharing my story today about making jam. And I am calling in from the place where that story um, took place in my studio apartment in Miami, Florida. 
So let's get to it. So the story is called Jam Making in the Midst of Tropical Storm Ada. I didn't know I would be making jam at three o'clock in the morning, but there I was. I was 26 years old. I had just moved out of my family's home and was living alone for the very first time. I had found a studio apartment in Miami with bright yellow walls that reminded me of sunshine, and it was perfectly cozy. On this November day in 2020, my new tiny home was in the path of a tropical storm with the strongest impacts projected to hit throughout the night. At the time, I was working in a climate organization and I had acquired some hurricane preparedness skills. Although I was equipped with emergency supplies, I was entirely unprepared for what awaited me. In the early afternoon, the wind started howling and my windows started shaking. Debris violently pummeled into the window panes and I felt they would crack at any time. It was then that I became afraid for my life. As the evening arrived, I found myself debating whether to go to sleep. I feared that if I fell asleep, I would awaken to windows bursting and I would be sucked into the storm like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. I tried calming exercises and attempted to sleep, but I was unable to. The hours passed by so slowly and I turned to a source of comfort to keep my nerves at bay. I started to cook. In the twilight hour of three o'clock in the morning, I took mixed berries out of my freezer and started making jam on the kitchen stovetop. My pot stirring distracted me from the deluge of rain and debris that surrounded my building. I didn't end up sleeping at all that night. And fortunately in the morning, I emerged safe from the storm, but the experience changed me. You see, I have been involved with environmental activism since I was a teenager, but I have never experienced a fear like the fear I felt of being sucked out of my home into a storm. I thought I was going to die. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists, as the climate warms, scientists project that on average, tropical cyclones and hurricanes will have higher wind speeds and higher precipitation rates. This particular night, the storm highlighted the very real vulnerabilities that so many people, myself included, experience. I'm a climate educator by profession, and I have often talked to members of the public about the intersection of the climate crisis and social justice. As many of you know, though, it's different to experience something firsthand rather than talking about it to somebody else. I thought I could protect myself from a storm with my supplies and my climate knowledge, but that's not true. None of us are immune from these threats. Our communities have many issues of inequity and we need to address them on a global scale. Lives are at stake in this climate crisis and our cultural emphasis on being independent and self-sufficient needs to change. We need each other. We need governments enacting creative, large-scale, and community-informed solutions. We need corporations to stop lying to us with their greenwashing messages, and instead foster a culture of authentic climate leadership and ingenuity rooted in community. We need community members to speak up, and we need decision makers to listen and act accordingly. Let's host more town halls, more climate rallies, more community events. Let's foster more spaces for sharing our climate stories, indigenous knowledge, and our feelings. Let's make plans for more green and blue spaces, more renewable energy, less pollution, and less environmental degradation. I believe we can counter the darkness of the climate crisis with the optimism of the climate movement. It's going to take all of us. So bring yourselves, grab a chair, and join the movement. It's going to be a long conversation, but if we get hungry along the way, I can bring some bread and jam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. Give a round of applause up here. Thank you so much. That was really fantastic and really inspiring. Our next, um, our next speaker this evening is uh, Susanna Gibbons. 
Susanna is the Managing Director of Funds Enterprise at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. She serves on the Investment Advisory Council for the Minnesota State Board of Investments, the Editorial Board for the CFA Society of Minnesota, and the chair, and she's the chair of the Investment Committee for the Girl Scouts of River Valley. Uh, she's working on green finance uh, for greenhouse gas emission reduction projects and explores the connections between finance and environmental issues. I'll pass it over to Susanna now. All right, thank you. Um, and first of all, Julia, that was an amazing story. Um, and so now I'm sitting here thinking, well, how on earth do I follow up JAM with a riveting discussion of the corporate bond market? And so I, I can't really. Um, and so I thought, well, I guess one of the things I will share is, um, you know, my whole professional career has been in the investment business. I feel like in many respects, I'm here representing the enemy. Um, but I guess one message is I, I'm, I'm not really. Um, most of the clients I have ever had are pension plans and foundations and endowments. And most people in the investment business are actually managing money for others. Um, and those others have over the last decade really mobilized in exactly the way that Julieta has described um, to demand um, more of the companies that they choose to invest in. Um, and so that's my perspective and how I came to this. Um, so at the Carlson School, I, um, I got involved with IONE a couple of years ago and just started having conversations with people at IONE. And so the only thing I will follow Jam up with is cheese, um, which is the primary reason I got involved in the project that I've been working on for the past year. And so after learning um, from you know, some of the climate education work that others have done, the incredible GHG intensity of um, all dairy thought, well, okay, I can give up, I could give up eating beef, I could give up milk. I'm not so crazy about giving up ice cream, but I probably should, but I am not giving up cheese. And so what is it that I can do from my perspective? What, what skills can I bring to this equation um, to solve the problem of cheese? And so that is why I got involved with um, folks um, at IONE on a project for how to bring green finance to GHG emission reduction on dairy farms. Uh, um, and I'm not gonna go through the whole project, but I am gonna just maybe share a couple of observations. One observation, um, and this ab absolutely shocked me, it maybe won't shock other people, is that the technological solutions exist. The technological solutions exist to have a major impact um, um, you know, in, in a matter of years. Like we don't actually have to wait decades. There are solutions that exist if we can only get ourselves organized around the problem. And, and so connecting with um, many, many different people to think about the problem from multiple angles is what I've been wrestling with most recently because I feel like many of the approaches are, um, they follow accounting rules. It's like, if you do this many of this, then you'll get to here. And then you do this many of this and you get to there. And really, there's a rethinking of entire systems um, that, um, that we need to engage in. And how do we mobilize um, investors and um, individuals and companies and governments to engage in a simultaneously rethink of systems? And this is not an easy problem. Uh, um, and so that's kind of where I've been, where I've been stuck, that the idea that the solutions are there so that I can eat cheese. Uh, um, and yet we're we're not able to mobilize yet around this problem. And so maybe just a couple of a couple of facts just from the investment side of the equation. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard of green bonds, right? Green bonds are sort of an important tool in, in green finance. Um, and because there are so many pension funds and there 
There's so many foundations, endowments, and individual investors who want their investing dollars to have a positive impact. They have been pouring money into green bond funds. And so then these green bond funds go out and look for companies who are raising money to specifically invest in um, um, you know, climate, um, climate change mitigation strategies. Last, um, last year, there were over $200 billion in investments in green bonds. One year, $200 billion. This year, through, September, through the end of September, over $165 billion were invested in green bonds. And so there's, there is demand and interest from investors in investing in solutions. But we haven't closed the loop yet because these companies, as far as I see, are investing in only the most marginal of solutions. And so that's part of why I'm, you know, I'm I'm excited to go to COP26 because I want to see how we get people from where we are right now to investing in truly transformative solutions as opposed to only marginally impactful solutions. Because um, I think the interest is there from investors, um, but we need a massive systemic shift to take place in order um, to bring us to that next step. So I think I'll stop there. I think that's probably enough. Um, and I'll just pass it back to, back to Gabe. You get to actually pass it to me. Thanks, Susanna. <laughs> Not to confuse you. <laughs> <laughs> that was so interesting. I can't wait to meet up and talk to you when we are in Glasgow. Um, well, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next storyteller, Ashley Fairbanks, who um, is, generally lives in San Antonio, Texas, but she hails from Minnesota. Um, and she is the creative director for the 100% campaign. Ashley is a Anishinaabe from the White Earth Nation and has over 15 years of experience in electoral politics, activism, and creative storytelling as a designer, public artist, and professional communicator. She is a passionate organizer for issues like Stopping Line 3, Indigenous Rights, and Police Abolition. And in her work for the 100% campaign, Ashley's work to tell climate stories at center on the personal and human side of the climate crisis. She's been an Aspen Ideas Fellow, Rockwood Tech Kitty Fellow, and Humphrey School Community Policy Fellow. So thank you, thank you, Miigwech. Ashley, take it away. Bonjour, Asanoikwe Indigenous, Ajijak and Dudame, Gawa Babigani Kong and Dunjaba. Uh, my name is Ashley Fairbanks, or Afanawikwe in Ojibwe, um, and I'm from the White Earth Nation uh, in northern Minnesota. I was born and raised in Minneapolis, but I'm temporarily displaced in San Antonio, Texas. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I will read my story for y'all. I'm uh, excited to be here with you tonight. So. I don't remember if it was the day of or the day after. We started at an intersection, the one outside of the precinct that was finally burned. That one loomed over there by us, the one that loomed over there, over us our, my whole life. We started there. Am I blending my memories together now because I don't remember if it was the same day that someone ran their car over a young person just a few feet away from me. And it was the, the first time that that terror felt real, our separation from everyone else as I read for the first time in a Facebook comment, this is what they deserve for standing in the streets. But we didn't know what else to do besides stand in the streets because at least there we were together. We took the highway for the first time and it seemed so big and bold then, but it seems so normal now. And I remember how much bigger the road signs seemed as we laid under them. It felt so wrong to lay in the road and downtown felt so far away. But I knew then for the first time that this was the work for the rest of our lives. This is the work for the rest of our lives. But I couldn't understand what that really meant. More than anything, my experience of climate change is the one that has happened inside of me. The fear and the anxiety, 
the impacts on my choices, on my career, on my fertility, on my whole life. I carry it with me every day. I said the other day that it felt like walking through a hallway with an armful of books, people rushing around you as the books are falling and you're paralyzed, you don't know what to do. I know intellectually that all of the things that have happened around me for my entire life are also parts of the climate crisis. The storms, the droughts, the polar vortexes, but I feel the impacts that live in my heart the most. After that, it's not data or statistics or the number of years until our doom. It's the things that may seem small to other people, but bring me so much grief. Like the first year of my life where we couldn't harvest maple sap. My ancestors survived genocide and Indian wars and boarding schools and termination policies, but our ways cannot survive this. What more will we lose? I remember the first time that I went to Sugarbush. I was small and now I think about it and I wonder about the kids that I won't have because I can't bear to bring them into this world because it feels wrong to ask them to survive it. I think about the years in the future that there won't be a harvest. I think about our wild rice, our monomen at risk from the pipelines and mining and new algae that will thrive as the temperature rises. I think of our fish at risk from invaders, take that how you will. These are the pieces of us that our people work so desperately to hold on to and what comes next wants to take us from them too. It feels too heavy for me to carry. In the darkest moments, I remember the words of Ricardo Levens Morales when I laid my despair at his feet and he took a sip of coffee and reminded me that powerful forces want us to feel grief. They want us to live in despair because there is no power there. I remember the words of a poem by his sister Aurora, words spoken by many before and after her, words that I've now tattooed on my body. Another world is possible. There will be a society after ours. There will be descendants after our descendants. The planet will go on. The fish and the deer and the rice and maybe us. There will be survivors. And we owe it to them to fight the way that our ancestors fought for us, the way that they dreamt us into the future, the way that they, in times of despair, larger than we can ever imagine, they thought of us. They had the courage to go on. This is what keeps me going. So I'll keep believing and I'll keep waking up and fighting. I'll keep dreaming our future into existence. That is the work for the rest of our lives. This is the work for the rest of our lives. And I'm finally beginning to understand what that means. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Ashley. That was really phenomenal. Understanding the work for the rest of our lives that really resonates. And, and thank you for sharing that. That was really powerful. Um, I uh, will introduce our next storyteller uh, this evening, Barb Thies. Barb is a community manager at the University of Minnesota Education and Human Development um, Department at the Center for Open Education. And she's also an MPA student with a concentration in development practice at the Humphrey School. Barb has 10 years of experience in international education, promoting learning abroad opportunities for students and is passionate about the connections between international education and climate justice. So Barb, take it away. Thank you and hello from Scotland. It's an honor to be with you all this evening and hear these beautiful climate stories that my fellow delegates are sharing. My climate story is a bit of a winding one. I've always had a passion for caring for the environment from collecting change in second grade to help save the rainforest to geeking out on recycling and composting. Until recently, my interest in conservation and climate action has been more of a hobby and personal interest that was more peripheral to my career path. Professionally, I've worked in education, outreach, and communications throughout my career, and it was really my work in international education that inadvertently began to weave these 
personal climate action interests and my professional world together. I used to organize study abroad programs to Latin America, and as part of that work, I visited various rural communities in Mexico, Central and South America that would host our students. And while connecting with the people in those communities, there were a number of times where I found myself in conversations where our local partners would comment on how their climate had changed noticeably in the past 10 to 20 years. Uh, for example, in one of the communities in Costa Rica that I worked with, my colleagues were lamenting on how their town used to be known as um, the beautiful name, the city of eternal spring, but that temperatures were much warmer and more variable to the point where it was beginning to feel like a misnomer and they weren't really even referring to their town in that way anymore. I also worked with programs to Puerto Rico at the time that it was hit by hurricanes Irma and Maria that really devastated the island back in 2017. So kind of unexpectedly connecting with my colleagues in a number of different countries on strikingly similar stories of a changing climate when really usually I was just down there to talk about study abroad programs and nothing related to climate change. And also observing these extreme weather events and how they very deeply affected the people that I worked with caught my attention and got me thinking about how our study abroad programs might be contributing to climate impacts on these vulnerable communities that we were visiting. Um, and so at the time, the, the field of international education, there was a lot of discussion around responsibility and mitigating cultural impacts of sending groups of students to these communities. But I felt that there was a gap in acknowledging potential environmental impacts. So one of the first research projects that I did in grad school was digging deeper into this topic. And ultimately I found that there were no consistent practices in place to mitigate the environmental impacts of short-term study abroad programs with the providers that I interviewed. And it wasn't even really a conversation uh, at a broader level within the field either. So. Um, not only was that a kind of an important indicator that from a program management level, there was plenty of work to be done in terms of making sure that we weren't adding to the burden of climate change impacts that these communities were experiencing, but we were also really missing out on a, an easy and what seemed kind of obvious to me opportunity to educate our students on the disproportionate effects of climate change on people around the world and how to be good stewards of the environment and to the communities that they may visit in their travels over the course of their lifetimes and even at home within their own communities. Um, so this notion has really kind of stuck with me and I, I see how it plays out in many ways in our society that many of us who are not necessarily directly involved in public policy or science or engineering feel, feel that our fields of work are on the fringes of climate action and therefore we miss great opportunities to be a part of the solution. Or those of us who don't necessarily feel the direct impacts of climate change in our own backyards on a daily basis, don't necessarily feel the urgency of addressing the climate crisis. And yet, as we all know here, um, climate change impacts do affect us all, particularly the most vulnerable among us. And it's gonna require a massive collective effort to get us where we need to be in terms of lowering greenhouse gas emissions and transitioning to, to more sustainable ways of being. So that's kind of where my background in education, outreach, communications and community management is now colliding with my studies around climate justice. My interest lies in building community at the local level around climate change mitigation efforts helping people see these connections and its relevance to their lives, their values, their work, and um, also helping them feel empowered in their ability to contribute to positive change in their communities and ultimately to, to this global issue. So I don't necessarily know exactly how I'll go about integrating all of these, um, all of this into my career or my work at the university just yet, but I'm really hoping that attending COP26 can help me discern a little better what that might look like um, so I am approaching this experience from a community engagement angle. There's uh, next Thursday's theme is youth and public empowerment. And so really excited to learn more about how communities around the world are engaging, educating and empowering their citizens around just and equitable climate action. Um, and then the US Center that's a part of the overall event is also hosting a session 
in collaboration with the Americas All In Coalition on Society-Wide Mobilization to Meet Climate Goals. So also very interested in learning more about the initiatives and strategies for engaging communities domestically that are being put forth by the US government in this space. And I think just overall, um, you know, the climate change outlook can feel a bit grim at times. So I'm just really looking forward to soaking up the energy of the thousands of people from all corners of the world who are coming together uh, and are dedicated to driving climate action and gives me really hope, uh, a lot of hope for the future. So very thankful for this opportunity and the opportunity to represent the University of Minnesota delegation at the conference. Thanks, Barb. Uh, also super excited to connect with you because it sounds like education and connecting with folks is the same kind of stuff we're doing. So I'm excited um, to see you in Glasgow. Um, our uh, Climate Generation's last delegate, we still have two more awesome speakers this evening. Um, our final storyteller this evening is Betsy Wilkening. Uh, Betsy is joining us from Tucson, Arizona. Um, she has uh, the, she has been the education outreach coordinator with University of Arizona's uh, Project What, as well as president of Polar Educators International. Uh, Betsy is a learner, an engineer, an educator, an environmentalist, a volunteer, a wife, a mom, and an activist. And her career has spanned jobs in industry and teaching and professional development and outreach and community engagement. As a teacher, she had the opportunity to work and visit the Arctic, which led to becoming a founding member and now president of Polar Educators International. Betsy's Hispanic roots run deep in the Sonoran Desert, and as members of her community are disproportionately affected by extreme heat, drought, and extreme storm events, she is passionate about empowering all to take action to build a more resilient community. Thanks for joining, Betsy. And mute myself here. Um, welcome from Tucson on uh, the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham and the Pascoyaki nations. I'll start my story. My son is failing his Spanish course since he won't hand in his homework. Every time I ask about her friends, my daughter gets upset and locks herself in her room. I've been asking my son to help get our equipment together for the upcoming hunt and he won't budge from his video games. This was all part of a conversation I had with fellow parents sharing the trials of parenting teenagers. It's typical of conversations that are heard in the aisle of a grocery store, soccer field, or school parking lot. What was truly unique about this particular conversation was that it took place out on the frozen Chukchi Sea of Utkatavik, Alaska. My fellow parents were Stoika, a Canadian scientist of Bulgarian descent, and Roy, our guide and a member of the Inupiat Nation. In the spring of 2009, I had the opportunity to participate in an international science project called OASIS as a Polar Trek teacher in Ukadovic, Alaska. Polar Trek is a program that pairs teachers and researchers together in scientific field work in either the Arctic or Antarctic. The OASIS project included 30 or 30 plus researchers from institutions across the globe. They combined many research projects that centered on the way pollutants make their way across the ocean, atmosphere, sea ice, and snowpack, hence the acronym OASIS. The polar regions and Arctic communities are vulnerable to these contaminants because of the long range transport of atmospheric pollutants. As a teacher, I brought the experience back to my seventh grade students through blogs, a live event, and eventually lessons. One such lesson led my students to request an understanding why there is mercury in our seafood. How an OASIS scientist was measuring mercury concentrations in various mediums in Alaska, and how actions we take affect those living in the Arctic. One of my students' parents commented about how this lesson accomplished a behavior in her daughter that she was never able to instill. The student went around the house turning off lights because she recognized that energy received from a coal-fired power plant produces atmospheric mercury and eventually ends up in our food chain. 
Prior to my expedition, the coldest temperatures I had experienced with any frequency being born and raised in Arizona was the walk-in refrigerator at Costco. In Alaska, I quickly learned that the two temperature scales, Fahrenheit and Celsius, meet at negative 40 degrees. Eventually, I became comfortable with my outside snow sampling work on the tundra field near the research center. I can still remember the excitement and trepidation I felt on the day I was invited to travel from the research center to the sea ice with a smaller group of researchers visiting their sampling site. Roy explained that I couldn't venture out of his sight since it was his job to scare away polar bears with his rifle. Stoika patiently explained that I could ease the death grip I had on her waist from the seat behind her on the snow machine. I learned that sea ice is much colder than the snowpack on the tundra. And when you get cold, you have to move to get warm. So while the scientists were debugging instruments and downloading data, I ran as much as you can in giant boots and many, many layers of clothes back and forth on the Nihilus, the new sea ice. My path paralleled the polar bear tracks left behind in the beautiful frost flower crystal structures that formed on the Nihilus. It was a wonderful opportunity to see the frost flowers we'd been flowers that we'd been analyzing in the laboratory up close. They're formed when the brine or the salty water and the sea ice wick the moisture out of the air. Eventually, I warmed up. Stoika finished her work, and we had time to chat about our teenagers at home with Roy while another scientist completed his work. I was heartened to find that despite all of our differences, our unique backgrounds, geographies, and perspectives, we had so much in common to share. I've revisited this experience recently with a myriad of emotions. Sadness and anger bubbled to the top. Parenting was so much easier in 2009 than it is today. My children are able to attend school, hang out with friends, and participate in extracurricular activities. Now in 2021, after a year of remote and hybrid COVID-19 restrictions, students are back in the classroom with a more contagious strain of the virus taking hold. Common sense would tell you to take all the necessary precautions to protect our youngest and most vulnerable members of society who are not eligible for the vaccine. Unfortunately, in Arizona and many other states, children's are now a political pawn with laws against mask mandates and vaccination requirements. I'm angered by this. No child is expendable. We're failing our children by not being able to provide them with safe opportunities to learn, play, and socialize. How did we get to this point? If I spoke to a parent, grandparent, aunt, or uncle individually about their young ones, wouldn't they tell me that they want the best for their child? I believe that the disconnect comes into play lies within understanding what is best. Misinformation and disinformation is a more insidious virus that is skewing the understanding of the best way to combat COVID-19 in order to keep our children safe. Misinformation and distrust in science has also been an easy way to disregard and undermine another global challenge we face, climate change. If we can't protect our children from a virus, how can we not only protect them, but also provide a future where they can thrive in the prevalence of climate change? Anger can fuel us in moving forward, but it also drains our energy. Battling misinformation and distrust in science is a big step towards creating the world we want for our children and their children to thrive in. It takes courage to leave your comfort zone, listen, learn, and reach across the aisle to those who don't think the same as you. In truly listening to others, we can develop empathy. We can find that common ground and help others to make the connections necessary to move forward in facing our global challenges. In 2009, I summoned all the courage I had, leaving my family and warm home to travel to the Arctic for a month to learn more about our world and what I could do to protect it. I listened, learned, and experienced cultures different from my own. 
Now is the time for all of us to summon the courage and to find ways to push past our comfort zone to act on climate change in bold ways. I plan to reach across that metaphorical aisle, engage in conversations that can be difficult to tell the truth, find that common ground, and connect others with ways of combating climate change. One thing I learned on the sea ice that day is that connecting with others just requires the courage and commitment to take that first step and to make it plain that we are all fighting for the same thing, what is best for our children. Thanks. Thank you so much, Betsy. I, that was a really powerful story and I'm really picking up on your message of courage and, and how courage can be, look like many different things, including talking to people who don't agree with you. I think that's a really uh, powerful message and an important one right now. So I, I get to introduce our final storyteller presenter this evening, Sam Reed. Sam is a fifth year PhD student at the University of Minnesota in natural resource science and management and is the holder of a prestigious National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. He's interested in the compounding ecological disturbances in forests, as he believes this is a phenomenon and a portal to see uh, the Earth's ecological future. His dissertation is on compounding disturbances, ecological resilience, and the turbulent forest. And he also received the uh, University of Minnesota a prestigious a President's Student Leadership Service Award recognizing his accomplishments and contributions to the university and the surrounding community. All right, Sam, take it away. Hi, everyone. I didn't type that. Uh, so whoever did, thank you. That was very nice. Um, so uh, in terms of my climate story, I have been thinking about where I am right now and where I kind of hope to be into the future. Um, I didn't really write about why I'm here today. Um, I kind of wrote about where my head is and where I see myself going into the future and kind of the different hats that I'm wearing uh, as I go on. Um, and one of the most important to me is being an ecologist, being a graduate student, being a young person. Um, and obviously, eventually, being a young person will change. And so will being a graduate student. But uh, being an ecologist is something that I kind of see as being for the rest of my life. And that's someone who sees the connections between things that are living and things that aren't living. So our relationship with the other humans, our relationship with the climate, uh, all of that kind of falls under the umbrella of ec ecology in my mind. Um, and I'm particularly, particularly interested in disasters and disturbances. So, you know, we know that climate change is going to make these things worse. They're gonna become more frequent. Um, and although mitigating climate change is incredibly important uh, and the main thrust of this conference, uh, there's really no reality in which we're not dealing with these adverse effects. The, the, the die has been cast in a lot of ways. Um, for instance, my grandmother, who's on this call right now, um, just lost their house to Hurricane Ida a few, a few months ago. Um, and that is the reality that a lot of people are staring down. And, you know, it, it also means that there's there's one person on this call who's going to support me no matter what, uh, if my story doesn't turn out all too well. Uh, so thank you. Um, and that same hurricane that hit her house, at, it, she hadn't been affected by hurricane in 75 years. Um, it traveled over land and killed dozens of people in the Northeast. I mean, that is unheard of. The heat waves that were in the Pacific Northwest killed hundreds of people. Um, so, so climate change is here, it's now. Um, and really what I want to do into the future is help transition these socio-ecological systems to, to improve their resilience to these disasters. Um, and I, differentiate between disturbances and disasters and there's there there is reason to because disasters are created by a lack of forethought they're created by not having system resilience and not looking out for the people who are most vulnerable um, and allowing them to get hurt whereas disturbances are inevitable hurricanes and fires at this point they are inevitable but disasters are preventable 
Um, so really going into the future, mine is my goal is working with the community to prevent disasters from happening. Um, and kind of on a on a more particular and specific note, you know, I'm really interested in these chronic disasters. So things that are kind of underneath our noses, the things that maybe aren't as noticeable or we're not paying enough attention to and how they interact with the big disasters, the things that, you know, news news stations are um, playing like hurricanes and fires, but never attributing to climate change, um, or at least not enough. Um, so for instance, how does the combination of an invasive species and a hurricane influence the resilience of the forest? Um, so that's one thing, that, that's just an example of one way that these disturbances and disasters can interact. And how does the loss of resilience of a forest, so like, um, you know, the health of the forest, how does that end up influencing human dominated ecosystems? Um, and then potentially from a more sociological perspective, how does something like chronic poverty or a chronic disease like COVID and then wildfire influence human ecosystems? I mean, every single one of these disasters and many, many more are influenced by climate change and are going to become more of an issue. So I guess going forward, um, when it comes to COP, what I want to know is, are we thinking about these things one dimensionally? Are we only thinking about a fire as just a fire? Or are we thinking about it as interacting with all of these other issues at play? The poverty that we have ignored for decades, the lack of health insurance, which is a disaster for many that we have ignored for decades. Um, and are we thinking about these things in a combined way from a perspective of multiple compounding, hugely influential disasters? Uh, because that's what we're gonna be facing. Um, and then I guess transitioning uh, as a graduate student and a young person, uh, I feel as though I'm really afforded kind of the freedom to think freely about these issues and see COP26 as a pretty pivotal moment um, in working along this front. I really, I, I wanna meet the people who are passionate about all aspects of the climate conference and working to make change within their own communities. Um, so basically meet the people who are just like me and looking down the path of climate disaster and all the uncertainty that it brings um, to connect with people who are actually wanting to do something about climate change and support them uh, as they remind the bullshitters, the small thinkers, the naysayers, all of those, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the Exxon Mobil CEOs that uh, the world is watching and we really need to do something um, either at the global scale or within their own communities. So that, that's where my head is. Thanks, Sam. Uh, your last part here about meeting other people as a way to inspire continued action and feel part of a community. That really resonates with me too about my first experience at a COP. It was just being in this kind of sea of thousands of people who are all deeply passionate and devoting their lives to climate action. That's really given me a lot of energy. So with that, I wanted to turn first to a question to our panelists. First of all, thank you all so much for sharing your stories this evening and spending this time with us to offer any reactions to what you heard from each other. Did anything resonate um, in what you heard from uh, the other storytellers this night? And as we turn to you, also encourage our attendees um, to use the Q&A feature to type in any additional questions. So I'll open up to our panel first, any uh, reactions to each other? All right, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, first of all, really beautiful storytelling. Um, and from someone who doesn't come from that um, professional world, um, I'm just in, in awe of your ability to capture um, um the emotion um um yeah so that it's it's um just beautiful storytelling and i think that's important to bring um bring along to this conference um and then the the second thing that just jumped out at me um was 
just Sam's mention of the one dimensional thinking. Um, and that's really the thing that um, has been um, has been striking me about many attempted solutions are really relying on very one dimensional thinking. And so I, um, I appreciate the use of that phrase because I think it's an impediment um, to, to getting to finding real solutions. I'll go ahead and share. Um, I think one thing that resonated with me across all the different um, stories was the um, working together and, and understand that we're in this all together. And even though we have different stories and we have different ways that we're coming at it, is just understanding the interconnectedness and um, ways that when we work together, we can really make a bigger impact. Anyone else have any? We have lots of great questions, so we can ask another one. All right, well, I'm gonna jump in and ask a question um, that um, I am interested in as well. Um, so what is, um, I, the, we know that climate change is um, intersectional, right? It's not just about uh, climate, it's about all sorts of things. And so I'm wondering how each of you sees it intersection, intersecting. And we heard some of this coming out in your stories, I think, but in your personal and professional life, both um, the impacts of climate change and also the intersection of like, of action and solutions, like the things that you can do. I can start us out. <laughs> I'll give you a, I'll give you a Tucson perspective here. Um, so um, my family's been in this area. I'm fifth generation. My kids are sixth generation, and you know we were here when it was Mexico. And um, I don't think that Tucson, at the rate we're going with heat and drought, is going to be a place that a seventh generation will want to live. You know, it's it's just getting crazy. So part of the work that I was involved with at the university was a, a resilience work where we basically brought back some of the older ideas and the traditional ideas of harvesting the rain that we have. So we only get 11 inches a year, but with that amount of rain, you can start growing shade with native trees. You can create the schoolyards, these pathways that are reducing the heat. So just simple things that you can do by redirecting water that would normally just go out into a street um, provides solutions that anybody can do. You know, you can just bring out a shovel and start digging <laughs> and do something that's that's going to help your environment. So I think what I would say is, you know, really think um, local, think simple, and then it grows into something bigger. Um, yeah, so I think I spent a lot of time negotiating uh, how much we talk about personal responsibility versus uh, personal advocacy to make sure that we are making like systemic, you know, broad changes. Um, but I think something that's come up lately, uh, and I've heard repeated over and over again, is the single most important thing that you can do is to make sure that you're a part of a community. Um, so whether it's an organizing community, um, you know, a base building organization, or if it's just like you and your neighbors getting together to plant a garden together, um, really like the most important thing that we can do is actually uh, make sure that we're not alone and capitalism really wants to like sell us on the idea that like we have to solve everything by ourselves um, but it's just really powerful to think about like how you can actually get together with other folks um, and organize for collective action not just political action but like how do you you know 
provide childcare for each other so people don't have to drive as much? Or how do you have a car share with, you know, a few of your neighbors? Uh, just basic things like that. Um, you know, the, the, the possibilities are pretty endless when we start thinking about how we can actually build together. Thanks, Ashley. Anyone else want to jump in on this one? If not, and one additional thing, kind ahead. of tying that together with collective action, because I think, you know, there's a lot, like I said, I geek out on recycling, I geek out on composting, but it can be overwhelming to think about how small those actions are compared to changing systems. And so Susanna's comments really resonated with me about how mobilizing our dollars can really drive that systems change because we know how economics factors into all that. And so kind of just that bringing that intentionality into how you spend your money, what you spend it on or don't spend it on, um, what you're supporting. And then um, that sometimes helps me feel like I am making a difference at, at a systems level in addition to kind of the smaller acts that I do in my day-to-day -day life. So I, I would agree with um, Barb's comment, but I also agree with Ashley's thought that part of the um, um, impacts of our system is to actually isolate us. And we are left with um, making choices from the limited opportunity sets that the market is providing to us. And um, so I think it's important to sort of move beyond that limited opportunity set that um, um, the, the, the market wants to provide. Um, and so individual action really does have to coalesce into collective action um, um, if we're going to get a wider range of solutions. Thanks everyone uh, for sharing those thoughts. The next question I had is, is really about um, you know, what really brought us together at UMN Climate Week was Tom Swain, who turned 100 years old. And in some of the conversations with, with Tom, really thought about climate change as an intergenerational issue. And he, you know, he can quote you know, verbatim Greta Thunberg's you know, speech at the UN. And this kind of connection across generations, I think is really powerful. When I was in graduate school, one of my um, cohort mates, I'll make a short plug, started a group called Dear Tomorrow, which was about making climate pledges to your children. And it was for parents to do that. And uh, Betsy, in your story, I heard a little bit you know, of, of your thinking about um, how, what climate change means to you in the context of the next generation. And Sam, I heard you talking a little bit also about um, your grand, your grandma and, and the experience with climate change. I want to just open to the panel thoughts about how climate change has uh, connected you with generations older and younger. I can start us off. Um, in my professional role at the Clio Institute, I work with students. Um, particularly from middle school through university. Um, and they are really impacted, not only mentally and, and emotionally, but also physically. And I, I speak to them on a regular basis and they wanted me to share this message at COP. That they're not doing this for funsies. You know, they're not becoming climate activists because they have nothing better to do or because they need community service hours and this is just what was available. They're doing this because they find it relevant and they find it important. Um, and they really want to be taken seriously by adults. So when adults say, let's start an intergenerational conversation, but then don't act upon what was you know, discussed in, in the meeting, it's really discouraging and frustrating for youth. So what um, one of the things that I'm going to be championing for in um, COP is not only inviting youth to you know, give their opinions and their insights, but also giving them space for them to be part of that decision-making. So that decision-making isn't um, only done by the same kinds of people. Here in South Florida, you know, we've been working really hard to get more youth into like local community councils and local government initiatives. 
Um, they're also working with the school board to implement more renewable energy in schools. And so we're, we're working on it, but I'd love to see more youth decision-making ability um, in all of the places where decision-making happens. Uh, so that's a message that the youth wanted me to share. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Go ahead, okay. Sam. Um, well, I was just, uh, I'm thinking about like my relationship with, you know, the intergenerational aspects of climate change. And um, well, first of all, my grandmother messaged me and said that it's my grandfather's house as well that was lost. So, uh, he was upset that I just mentioned her. Um, but, uh, you know, I kind of have, I, I have some, uh, I guess I've had mixed experiences here. Um, and, you know, like I, my, my uncles have told me that I am focused on conspiracy theories and wasting my life away. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of that, that, that always is kind of like in the back of my mind, not that I'm wasting my time, but more so like, is it even worth it to try and engage there? Um, but then, the countervailing force there, people like my grandmother. Um, I mean, she is, she ran for Congress uh, against Steve Scalise, Bernie Sanders visited her house. She is a climate activist. She is uh, spectacular in so many different ways. And, you know, I feel as though um, from a learning and growth perspective, uh, I, I, I don't know if I would be where I am without her. So I think a lot of that just goes back to community and that like um, there is, there's a lot to be gained um, from, from, from all the different members of different generations. Thanks, Sam. The other, Ashley, did you wanna? Yeah, to say real quick, um, if you go to 100% Campaign's page on Facebook um, or on Instagram, uh, it's just 100% MN is our username. Uh, some of my favorite videos that we've done, we do a lot of video work as part, part of our cultural work. Um, and my favorite videos that we've done have been intergenerational videos. So asking parents and kids to film videos together. Um, and we've also just spent a lot of time talking about um, what I think is a very under discussed thing in the kind of like NGO world, which is like the way that uh, the climate crisis is impacting people, um, people's personal fertility decisions. Uh, so that's like one of my, my main things I'm interested in. We've held a few conversations about it, um, but it's like almost every woman I talk to uh, it, that's, uh, you know, it all thinking about climate uh, in their twenties or thirties has thoughts about how they've, processed the climate crisis with their decisions to have kids. Um, so for me, that's one thing that's really connected me more to people in my generation um, and, and not just women either, right? There's people of all, all genders who are concerned about that as part of their, their choices about parenthood. Um, and I think it's really interesting to talk with our parents and grandparents about what the fears were in their time. Um, so when, when this came up, I never really thought about it before, but it was like, oh, like, you know, some of our grandparents were having kids during like the nuclear crisis uh, when they thought the world could like literally end in a few days. Um, you know, so I don't know, that's, that's been a really interesting thing for me is really when we get past the data and trying to just dump science on each other, it, it, thinking that that's gonna move people, which I think we've kind of learned it's just, it's not, doesn't move people. Uh, when we actually get into the personal side, there's so much connection to be found. Love it, totally agree, thanks. Um, well, I think uh, we're gonna close out and hopefully everyone can um, think about this one and share um, just their thoughts on, you're all headed to COP um, 26 and um, we're just wondering what you hope to accomplish or what you are looking most forward to by being there and um, what you hope to bring back. Whoever would like to jump in first, please do. I'll 
Oh, I'll jump in. Oh. Go ahead. Um, so um, the main thing I'm looking forward to is just learning from other people. Um, and in some of the research that I've done, some, some of the um, work that has come out of the EU um, in particular around frameworks for, um, um, you know, frameworks for evaluating um, finance solutions are um, pretty far ahead of anything we're doing in this country. So I'm really looking forward to just learning from other people there and maybe bringing back um, some of the knowledge that um, has already been fleshed out in other places. I'm looking forward to my first experience at COP. Um, this is going to be a, an incredible time. And I'm really proud to be able to represent my community. Um, I, I live in Miami, but I'm also from Argentina and they're both really vulnerable places. Uh, and so I'm really honored to be a part of this climate generation delegation. So I'm excited to meet new people. It's also going to be the biggest gathering that I've been in since the pandemic started. So. I'm super prepared with the masks and the sanitizer, um, but I'm really excited to, to meet new people and experience uh, Europe for the first time. I am just excited to meet with native people from around the globe, uh, with indigenous people from different places. There's people coming from all corners of the world. Uh, and it's super exciting to think about um, not just meeting people, but uh, also just taking collective action with folks. There's some pretty cool events planned uh, to get indigenous people uh, really centered in the climate talks. And that is exciting to me. I'm looking forward to, uh, Susanna, to learning a lot more and also being able to start some more of those conversations and engage a larger community in this action that we're creating at this event. I'm hoping to bring back some optimism, uh, hope, path forward. just say a plus one to all that, which I kind of said at the end of my story, but most especially the hope and the energy, because I think that that's necessary and for all of us in moving forward. Great. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, and, and I hope all that, um, you know, comes true. I think, you know, COP is, um, it's such a large event with so many different pathways that, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm optimistic that that this will um, really deliver. I think it's um, yeah, a lot of us will be watching. Speaking of a lot of us uh, watching, um, I think in the chat you should see a link um, from uh, Kristen. I believe I saw it come through. Yes, um, the link to follow the blogs that Climate Generation will be um, populating during uh, COP26 and. Uh, and I believe there will also be a blog at the Institute on the Environment at the University of Minnesota with uh, some of the folks you've heard from tonight and others who are attending. Um, there'll be lots of opportunities to follow along um, on those blogs or on Twitter and um, really um, you know, eager to hear uh, your experiences. Um, as we wrap up here, just a, a few quick um, final uh, thoughts and comments here. Um, we're hearing from delegation members uh, who are going to COP26 next week and the week after. And uh, I saw in the chat earlier and just have always felt every year that it's so powerful to hear people after they come back too. And so uh, we'll also be uh, hosting a number of events. Um, Climate Generation will, we will here at the U and there'll be lots in the community um, with, with all the 66 plus folks um, who are going to COP from Minnesota. We have one event coming up on uh, November 22nd at 12.30 in the, at the Humphrey School uh, with our delegation. And um, I'll also throw in the link uh, into the chat just a moment here about um, 
uh, the rest of the swing climate initiatives um, that you can uh, track here. Kristen, maybe I'll give you the final word. Any last uh, thoughts about uh, COP or uh, upcoming things climate generation is doing? Um, no, like thanks for giving me the last uh, last speaking point. Um, yeah, uh, in the chat, please sign up for our digest. If you were captivated by these folks' stories, we have three other delegates as well who also have unbelievably beautiful stories to tell, and they are going to be. Lauren, um, my co-pilot and I are merely there to support. We are not the front face they are, thank God, because they're the talented ones. Um, so please follow us. And if you're on Twitter, follow us. We do also have a number of events um, that are happening during COP through our, our education program for the K-12 community and also a few um, web um, chats back. And that if you sign up for the digest, you'll, you'll find out about those. Um, and I'm just grateful to partner with Humphrey. What a great evening to do this. And good luck to everyone traveling. Um, for those of you who are not going to COP this year, the layers of paperwork and logistics to get to COP COVID free and stay COVID free is really a lot. So um, good luck to everyone on that. I just got my negative test. So I'm getting on an airplane tomorrow. Maybe, we'll see. <laughs> So thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great thank you. evening. Have a good night. Thank you all. It was wonderful. Thank, thank you. Bye. Good luck. Safe Thanks. travels.